Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the book The Great Democracy by Ganesh Siddharaman. Uh, I heard about this book on Ezra Klein's podcast, uh, which I'll link below. Uh, Ganesh Siddharaman was a, a guest on the podcast. But uh, the stuff that he talks about on that particular episode are quite a bit different than what he talks about in his new book, The Great Democracy. So you wouldn't necessarily learn any more about this particular topic by listening to that podcast. So this was an interesting book, but it was also pretty challenging. Um, it's not what I would call an entry level uh, political book, um, but more of like a medium level. I found it challenging as someone who doesn't have a lot of background in political science or politics. I also wouldn't say that it's a must read. Basically the main thesis is that in recent years in the United States and really in many other countries in the world, we've been in a period of neoliberalism. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. I'm going to talk about it soon. I also didn't know what it was before reading this book. And he says that neoliberalism, which was sort of the world's response to liberalism that came earlier, is now at a crisis point following the 2008 financial recession. And he suggests that there are a few different possibilities of where we might be headed right now. He says that some of them are more likely than others, and he advocates trying to move towards what his preferred scenario is, which he calls the great democracy, the title of the book. Then in the second half of the book, he outlines a lot of specific policy recommendations that he suggests would be part of having a great democracy. So to understand really any of the stuff that he talks about in this book, we have to begin with this topic of what is neoliberalism. And the author goes into quite a bit of detail about this. It's the first few chapters in the book. And although his explanation didn't quite clear everything up for me, it at least gave me a better idea of what neoliberalism is. And I think it'll be very helpful for understanding other discussions about this topic in the future. So he talks about first how in the United States, um, during the presidency of Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the New Deal and the recovery policies from the Great Depression, we were in a period of what he refers to as just plain liberalism. Liberalism is a broad topic and it existed uh, as a concept well before FDR, but I think he just points out Roosevelt and the New Deal as examples of a policy that was really um, kind of what he calls traditional liberalism that was focused on relief for the whole economy, um, including all different classes. And that's where the status quo was the, in the U.S. in the 1930s. Now then we had World War II and the Cold War. And following that, for reasons that either he didn't go into great detail about or I just don't remember super well, um, we entered into this period of neoliberalism. And the author identifies two key figures who were instrumental in the development of neoliberalism as a sort of policy of the Western world. One of those was the U.S. President Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, again towards the end of the Cold War. And another one was his contemporary Margaret Thatcher, who was the U.K. Prime Minister at the time. So now we're in a period of neoliberalism, which is like liberalism, but with some new concepts. That's what this neo added on to the liberalism is signifying. And I'll talk more in just a second about what those things are that neoliberalism adds on to liberalism. Now, I've been using the color coding a little bit here uh, in line with the U.S. political parties to signify that, um, so Franklin Roosevelt was a member of the Democratic Party, and then Ronald Reagan was a Republican, and Margaret Thatcher also was a more conservative member of Parliament. But the author points out that before we just jump to conclusions and say that neoliberalism is really a conservative thing, uh, he points out that actually it's a little bit more complicated than that. Because after Ronald Reagan's presidency, indeed we did see another conservative president in the U.S. who was George H.W. Bush um, that followed Ronald Reagan's eight-year term for another four years. And similarly in uh, the U.K., uh, John Major, another member of the conservative party, followed up Margaret Thatcher as prime minister. But after that, things got a little bit more complicated. Uh, as the author tells it, the Democratic Party or the more liberal-leaning Labour Party in the UK, both of them were getting kind of exasperated about the inability to win election. At least in the US, it had been 12 years since the Democrats had won an election. So when Bill Clinton entered office in, I think, 1992, he then effectively pitched a Democratic Party version of neoliberalism. And we saw similar trends from Tony Blair in the UK. And this maybe isn't so surprising. I mean, after all, uh, following the presidency of Franklin D. Roosevelt, we later had 
Dwight Eisenhower, who was a Republican president, but also carried through many of the um, liberal programs of FDR. But it just points out that although nowadays in the U.S., for sure, we often tend to think of the two parties as diametrically opposed on everything, they actually, for the past 40 years, have been fairly unified in their support of neoliberalism as a whole. Okay, so nothing more is really going to make a whole lot of sense until we answer this fundamental question of what is neoliberalism. So as I mentioned, it promotes the core principles of liberalism, which include democracy, free speech, um, supporting everyone's individual rights, but it also adds four new principles. One of those is deregulation. So the idea is that by deregulating the economy and corporations, that a more productive economy can be achieved. Uh, the second idea is liberalization, specifically with regard to foreign relations. And although I'm not really entirely sure what all of this entails, I think it has to do with international trade policies and to what extent these policies benefit uh, selected winners and losers as opposed to just being kind of open to everyone. I probably got that totally wrong, so I'm not gonna say more about it, but let me know if you have a better explanation of that. The third element is privatization. So the idea that whenever possible, goods and services that are essential to the people, even if they're ones that could be provided by the government, are instead provided by private actors. So thinking about recent healthcare discussions in the US, a privatization approach to universal healthcare would be maybe to still require that everyone gets healthcare and provide vouchers, for example, for people who are unable to obtain healthcare um, because they don't have enough money, but not to go so far as to have one uh, Medicare for all that's provided entirely by the central government and instead to have separate private companies competing with one another for the consumer base. And in some cases in the U.S. right now, we see both privatization and public options. For example, uh, in the case of schools, there are public schools. Everyone has the right to attend a public school if they want, but there are private schools as well. Um, some districts have private schools that are quite a bit better than the public schools. So it's not exactly that everything is equal. And then the last component is austerity or a balanced budget. This contrasts with the liberalism of, for example, FDR in the New Deal because FDR's New Deal was based on Keynesian economics, which argues that deficit spending to stimulate the economy is the way to have a stronger economy. Whereas austerity focuses on balancing the budget and in many cases also attempts to foster economic growth through strategies such as tax cuts, um, often for the corporations, um, in the spirit of thinking that this will make them more effective and incentivize businesses to situate in the U.S. or whatever country is practicing these principles. Now, the author is pretty critical, at least to some extent, of all of these components that neoliberals often advocate for. For example, deregulation seems like a good thing, and it does foster economic growth within businesses, but it also eliminates some important protections on consumers. For example, as he points out, if a company is dumping radioactive waste into the river and you just completely outlaw regulation, then that gets pushed on to the people of the country, and that's not going to be cool. And privatization also, although it does offer competition that you might not get from a completely government-run system, also has a downside in that the private interests, when they become powerful, also have a very strong influence on the government and the future policies being made. Sitaraman kind of sums up his critiques of neoliberalism, arguing that people want to have freedom, and they think that the thing that they need freedom from is government, because often we do need freedom from government. Governments can be strong and oppressive, but also private entities can also infringe on people's freedom in a way that means that a completely off-hands government is going to leave people vulnerable to the private interests instead. So government is what usually would be used to protect people from these entities. But if you have a neoliberal mindset, you can't do this because the government is the big bad guy and the companies are just trying to survive. So there has to be some compromise between freedom from the government and freedom from private interests, which is ultimately imposed by the government. He says that this kind of falls into a sort of cognitive bias that people often have, 
which is when you compare two potential systems, but one of them is an ideal and one of them is the reality. For example, when you compare ideal capitalism with practical socialism or vice versa, you end up getting sort of these straw man arguments that make it sound like one system is a utopian system when in fact it's really not. So he argues that here critics are making the mistake of comparing actual government with corruption and all with utopian private entities, uh, assuming that these private entities are also free of corruption and infringement on people's rights. I found this discussion of neoliberalism really helpful because although I can't say that I completely understand or agree with everything that he's claiming here, I do think that the overall themes that he talks about kind of explain why the U.S. sometimes works against democracy and for authoritarians abroad, for example, as opposed to the idea that this U the U.S. always supports democracy, why things are the way that they are right now, why we have what is mostly about democracy politically, but not necessarily what everyone thinks of as a ideal utopian sort of democracy. Of course, one reservation that I have about his arguments against neoliberalism is that I agree neoliberalism as practiced currently has some of these flaws that he describes, but is that alone enough of a reason to oppose everything that it espouses? Um, so sometimes it's unclear to me whether the criticisms the author offers are actually in fact a criticism of a practical neoliberalism versus an ideal great democracy as he calls it. So I wonder if he's a little bit guilty of the thing that he just criticized others of practicing. Now, I don't have an answer on that, but I do think it's worth considering whether some of the elements of neoliberalism that he talks about here can be helpful in smaller amounts. Okay, so he then talks about how in the year 2008, a financial collapse hit the U.S. and affected much of the rest of the world as well. He describes it kind of as a moment of reckoning for neoliberalism and signaled that there's this need for transition. Now, he argues that we'll move towards one of four possibilities. And you can think of these as four quadrants uh, in a sort of space of possibilities that are sectioned out. So on one axis, we have what he describes as, I think the words he used are nationalism versus liberalism. I'm not sure I totally agree with his use of the word nationalism here, because I think although what we're seeing in movements today involves nationalism, I think what he's really talking about is autocracy or sort of a rule by force by a central authority versus more of a democratic government that's mostly ruled by uh, what we think of as a political democracy with a lot of input from a lot of different people. And then on one axis, we have economic oligarchy versus economic populism. Oligarchy here means rule by the wealthy which is what he argues that we pretty much have right now within neoliberalism. And econ economic populism is the idea that the lower classes of society, the working class, uh, even the middle class in some cases, as opposed to just the wealthy elites, also need to have their interests respected. So depending on which of these quadrants you lie on in this spectrum, you can end up with one of four possibilities, which he calls reformed neoliberalism, nationalist oligarchy, nationalist populism, or great democracy, which is the big great thing that he wants us to go for. And he points out that this way that he's presenting it is really important because it requires to be in a great democracy. It requires not just political democracy where everyone can vote, but also this economic democracy where the government isn't really completely dominated by wealthy private interests. So right now, as he argues, we are in the upper left quadrant, as I've drawn it, um, in the neoliberalism quadrant, um, which is going to become reformed neoliberalism. And our goal is to get to the great democracy. But there are two other options that we can go to, which are nationalist populism and nationalist oligarchy. Now, he also claims, though, that really only two of these possibilities are real possibilities, um, from where we are right now. And now that's not to say that the other possibilities are never possible, but simply that they're just not viable right now. He says that if we were to move towards nationalist populism, that we'll actually just end up getting kicked into the nationalist oligarchy section because nationalist populism can't work in the way that people hope it does 
in an era where the big private interests have so much influence. And he points out that that actually is kind of what's happened in many other governments that have had more of a nationalist populism movement these days and that have tended more towards a national oligarchy like Russia or Hungary. And in fact, if you think about the U.S., it's possible that the same thing kind of happened here um, because Trump ran as sort of a nationalist populism um, candidate claiming to support the working people. And the author argues that we ended up more in a nationalist oligarchy situation where um, Trump's policies, he argues, are really more preserving the status quo for those who are wealthy while moving towards a more nationalist or at least conservative um, side of the left-right political spectrum. Now, he also says that reformed neoliberalism isn't really possible, too. He says neoliberalism has failed. He says there are some proposals that have been made to save neoliberalism, um, like these liberal-tarians, as he's calling them, a portmanteau of liberal and libertarian, uh, who are advocating for actually having the social welfare aspects of liberalism, but maintaining the deregulation that's characteristic of neoliberalism. He says that this isn't really going to work for reasons that I'm not going to go into. And in an argument that was actually presented pretty fast, and I couldn't quite grasp even when I went back and tried to listen to it again, he argues that if we try to stay with neoliberalism, what we're actually going to end up with is more of a nationalist oligarchy as well. And I don't really want to say much more about that because I simply didn't really understand what he was talking about that. So let me know if you've read the book or heard similar arguments, because uh, I'm curious to know why he thinks that this is going to happen. Thus, his argument here is that we're going to end up in one of two situations, either a nationalist oligarchy or a great democracy. I'm a little bit skeptical of this because to me, it seems like the great democracy scenario is going to be quite a bit more difficult to achieve than reform to neoliberalism. I think it's going to require real challenges to get to the great democracy. Uh, maybe if you agree with him, you'll say, well, in that case, that means we're going to move to the nationalist oligarchy. Um, I'm not really sure about that, but to me, I wasn't quite convinced that we're not going to end up in this reformed neoliberalism. And now while I was drawing with my new uh, tablet, I made this mark that for some reason I was unable to get rid of, <laughs> which is something that I'm working on right now. Uh, so forgive that. But what I was trying to draw is that to me, it seems kind of like I may be totally off base with this, but to me, it feels kind of like your Democratic Party voters are hoping for this sort of great democracy, this utopian as they see it of great democracy. And I would also say that I think your Republican voters are mostly, not all of them because there's some wealthy interests, but most of them are arguing for this nationalist populism. And to them, that is kind of the utopia that they're looking for, because the voters are going to be, in general, more favor of economic democracy, because more voters are lower class than wealthy. But it feels to me like the candidates that we end up with running for office on the Democratic Party side tend to be more of this reform neoliberalism leaning candidates, uh, like maybe Joe Biden seems to be a little bit more up that alley. The Republican candidates even someone like Trump, who claims to be a little bit more populist, effectively ends up being more of a nationalist oligarchy candidate. Um, so the candidates themselves are making it impossible to reach this economic democracy or economic populism at the bottom of the graph because the candidates are so determined by, for example, just a ton of funding from wealthy interests. So it's like we have our Democratic voter force pulling towards the bottom left, our, Dem our Republican voter force pulling towards the bottom right. But then we have this really strong private companies and wealthy individuals pulling us towards the top. And they don't necessarily care a ton whether it leans towards the left or the right. There are some favoring both. What they care is that they are going to continue to have the power in the oligarchy. And so what we get is we end up with candidates that really are more on the top of the spectrum rather than the bottom of the spectrum. Now that's just my kind of interpretation of things. It's certainly going to be oversimplistic and probably has some flaws in it, so definitely uh, let me know if you think that makes no sense. I'm not going to be offended. Uh, but I was hoping that that could illustrate the core concept of what he's talking about when he talks about these possibilities of the future, including the great democracy.
Okay, so he then talks more about what is there in a great democracy. It's going to involve political democracy, meaning basically just everyone can vote. There's a dem democratic election of officials. It's going to involve economic democracy, which is a little bit harder to tell how that relates to the whole voting process, but it means that not just the big wealthy individuals have say in the, the policy of, and regulations of the government. And he argues that we also need united democracy, which I don't think he explains super well, but with his sort of idea that neoliberalism has also accompanied this individualist mentality of how we can get ahead but it's gonna be at the expense of others. And he argues that this has broken us apart across state lines, uh, I would argue along other lines as well, and that we need to bridge all these gaps and bring people back together in order to have a real democracy. Now, I, I kind of agree with that, but I think that it's a really difficult problem to address that you have all these differing uh, groups within the United States. And I'm not sure that we can just enact a bunch of policies from where we are right now that will fix this. I mean, he talks about how this divide and conquer strategy has been used in recent history to, for example, fragment the working class society along uh, racial and other identity lines, when in fact, if all the people in the lower classes and the working class really grouped up together instead of fighting against one another, uh, they would have power to basically overcome the oligarchy and have a more populist uh, working class supporting government. And I thought this was an interesting section of the book, but I think he gets into areas that don't really go along exactly with the thrust of his central argument. So I'm not going to talk a ton more about this. I think there are other books that this discussion would be more appropriate with. So the second half of the book, and in my opinion, the weaker half of the book, is basically a bunch of policy recommendations on things that need fixing and new policy suggestions that he thinks we should adopt if we're going to have a great democracy. Now, I'm not saying I criticize all of these policies in and of themselves. I think he raises some interesting ideas, like funding college through this idea he calls Patriot Corps, where people do service for the country and then get to have a free four-year college in return at the end, or advocating for more public options, which is a whole discussion in and of itself, but having options that people can obtain essential services from the government instead of just being able to obtain, for example, health insurance through your employer. But all in all, this second half of the book came across to me more as just an enumeration of progressive liberal talking points, uh, which he is a progressive liberal and has worked with Elizabeth Warren. So I don't think it's a problem that he has these ideas, but I don't think that he does an adequate job of completely fitting them in with his overall great democracy theme other than that these are things we might have if we had a great democracy. I mean, he talks about a lot of things, uh, sometimes just jumping from one to the next. He talks about police reform, climate change, uh, Patriot Corps, as I mentioned. He talks about media and news reform. He talks about uh, maybe having a national endowment for journalism that incentivizes you know, quality reporting that's not just clickbait sort of news stories. He talks about immigration ideas. Coming from an Indian immigrant family himself, he knows a little bit about what might make people feel more welcome. He advocates for new financial regulations, including more antitrust laws, more regulation of technology, like in Twitter and Facebook, more regulation of the whole financial sector that might have prevented something like this 2008 economic crash. He talks about public options, taxes, trade policy, a political process that's no longer responsive to the constituents, and outright corruption. For example, Congress staffers helping write complicated bills, then becoming experts on these complicated bills and then going in and working for the very firms themselves to help them navigate and get around these bills that they've written, which has created a whole new entanglement within the bureaucracy, uh, which is what he calls, and others have called, a technocracy, where things just become so complicated that it becomes infeasible to change them. And it actually just serves to support the status quo for a while because it's just too confusing on how to change things without a complete overhaul. And he proposes reforms of all sorts to these major problems. 
But again, none of them in the approximately three hour section that he talks about them really get enough justice for me to really imagine how they would work and how they might be implemented. So in summary for the second half of the book, beyond the criticism that I had of the first half of the book, which is that I just don't know whether the reformed neoliberalism is really as infeasible as he claims, so in the second half of the book, I would have really liked to see two major changes. For one thing, I would have wanted him to make the argument that these changes, these systems he's proposing are both economically and politically stable. So if he could just wave the magic wand and put all of these systems in place um, with no reform process necessary or anything, if they were just there, would they actually work the way that he says they would? Obviously, that's probably something that falls within the domain of another book, but since he's arguing that these changes are going to be critical for a great democracy and spends a decent amount of time talking about them, I think that's something that's really missing here because I'm sure that anyone who's critical of the changes he proposes could come up with a lot of objections that are not going to be adequately covered by this book. And then the second problem that I just kind of alluded to is how do we get to these proposed changes from where we are without just kind of waving a magic wand? Uh, how is it politically feasible to actually achieve these things that he's recommending, especially in a pretty resistant political climate where both sides are really kind of in a tug of war and not trying to come up with a compromise? And I think this is a major weak point because I think it kind of undermines his claim that we're headed towards two possible and likely possibilities of the great democracy or the nationalist oligarchy, uh, because I don't know that he's adequately demonstrated that the great democracy is any more possible than the other two possibilities that he ruled out. Okay, all that said, I have spent way too much time talking about this already, and there are a lot of things I didn't touch on, even for this short book. So as you can see, it has a lot of complexity. I think it's a book that will make you think if you read it, you might also learn some stuff about neoliberalism, but it's not one that I would necessarily recommend off the bat because I think it's a challenging read, and I think for the challenge that I had to put into it, I'm not sure I got as much out of it as I would have liked. <clears throat> the biggest thing that I got out of it was just understanding the definition of neoliberalism and what some critiques of it are. I hope you enjoyed my review, and I hope that the drawing aspect of it was at least somewhat entertaining even if just to laugh at how I struggled to make it work. So let me know what you thought, if you have other ideas, if you have any other recommendations. I will be trying to read some non-political books as well and talk about them soon, but I'm also still interested in reading a lot of nonfiction, including these political or history books, so I'd love to have suggestions for those as well. Bye, and happy reading!